Good evening. Whenever I hear about all of the titles of uh, the books I've written, I think about that uh, story that you've probably heard of the visitor from overseas who came to the United States and uh, was shown our television and an evening's performance and who then said, uh, well, who wrote that story that all of these people use on these shows? Because that is the story of the Infinite Way writings. There has only been one story used, and uh, it's used under many different titles. <clears throat> the reason that I especially want you to know that is this, that the message of the Infinite Way consists of principles which were revealed to me starting many, many years ago and which revelations continued over many years and that these principles have proven practical in our daily living experience. They are spiritual principles. They may also be called transcendental or mystical because they are not of this world and yet they have proven so practical in our daily experience that the story has to be told over and over and over again even if in a million different ways so that we ultimately come to the realization that one principle understood, demonstrated, changes our lives from the ordinary human life with its trials and tribulations and ups and downs to another mode of life, a mode of life that we do not ourselves live by taking thought. Again, I can quote to you a statement of Saroyan just a few years ago when he said, I do not live my own life. God lives my life and I go along for the ride. Of course, he was paraphrasing St. Paul I live, yet not I, Christ liveth my life. And actually, this life of the infinite way is exactly that, a life lived from within and yet not lived by us, but rather lived through us. It was William Blake in one of his poems many years ago who wrote that we do not see with our eyes, we see through our eyes. And again, this is another way of stating the same principle, there comes a, call it a transition in our experience, when we pass from living by taking thought, when we pass from living by our own efforts, when we pass from living by might and by power to living by the Spirit or living by the Christ. Now, the manner of this has been known throughout all ages. And in the Eastern world, it is so well known that there never would be a necessity of explaining this particular life, although in these days 
there is a great need for explaining in the East how this life may be attained since many in the East have lost the way in which this life is attained. But in the West it has never been known and with the exception of a very few hundred years uh, the Western world has never known how to live by grace how to live without taking thought. In uh, Japan they have a teaching about which you read a great deal these days called Zen. It is an offshoot of Buddhism. And uh, in Zen the student is brought along by the teacher to a certain specific point in which something takes place that we might call an awakening but which they call Satori. When Satori takes place the individual no longer has to live by his own wisdom, his own physical or mental strength or powers there is this transcendental something that lives his life, lives through him. In India they have this identical idea and it is called illumination. Sometimes Darshan explains it but again a student who has turned to the religious path finds himself eventually led to a certain teacher and this is never done by recommendation or by advertising it is always done by the student praying praying for guidance to his particular teacher and then being patient until one day he stands face to face with that teacher and recognizes, recognizes you are my teacher and very often the teacher recognizes you are my pupil and then begins a spiritual relationship that culminates only when that student also has an experience. It might be called illumination or awakening and in that moment something takes place within the consciousness of the student and the student finds themselves no longer a student but a realized man, a God-realized man and then to test this he is given a begging bowl and then for one or two years has to go out and travel across India without working and living purely by begging means by the support that is given by passers-by and he also must travel through woods, forests, mountains, valleys to prove that snakes will not bite him, animals will not annoy him, poisons will not touch him. In other words he can pass through all kinds of difficult human situations and come through untouched. And why? Because there is a transcendental presence there is a spiritual presence and power that not only goes with him but goes before him to make the crooked places straight that goes behind him as protection and walks on each side of him and yet it is invisible to human sense <coughs> intangible <coughs> now it has often been believed in the West that this life of mysticism is either a fairy tale 
or that it is something impractical. And it is only in this age that we are having the opportunity of proving not only that this is not a mythical way of life, it is a mystical way, a spiritual way, but that it is far more practical than anything that has yet been devised in the human picture. You recall, of course, that the Master, Christ Jesus, taught, resist not evil, put up thy sword, if you're sued, don't sue again. If something is taken from you, give twice as much. And of course, this is all considered very impractical for these days. It was just as impractical for his days. But as a matter of truth, it is far more practical than living with armies and navies and air forces far more practical because you are not only relieved of the expense but you are also relieved of the danger from an enemy because no enemies exist. It would be as impossible to live with this transcendental presence and have an enemy as it would be to live with it and then find oneself in danger from snakes or animals or starvation or any other form of physical discord. The difficulty for the human mind is to grasp this. That which we see, hear, taste, touch and smell seems so real and the powers of matter the powers of mind seem so real that it seems ridiculous to have a master declare that these are not power. In fact, to have a master stand before the highest temporal authority of his day and say, Thou couldst have no power over me unless it were given thee of God or to have him say, if you destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it up again. No. If we rightly comprehend the meaning of that word I, we can all live in that same consciousness. We can all live in that same peace, that same security, that same freedom, not only from fear, for there would be nothing to fear, but freedom from every discord of human experience. If we could admit, and I don't think this is going to be very difficult, I think we can admit that those of us who are here in this room now could live peaceably, honorably, joyously in close association for the rest of our days without taking up the sword, without carrying a revolver, without wearing armor plate, without building bomb-proof shelters. I think we could agree that there is enough of civilized consciousness among us at this stage of our unfoldment so that regardless of what question might arise between us, it could be settled amicably and peacefully and without recourse to violent means. Surely there is no one in this room now who does not believe or who cannot conceive that this is absolutely true, that we here at least have advanced to a place where any question that could come up, physical, mental, moral, financial, that we could bring about an adjustment 
between ourselves or between each other without recourse to force. Now then, let me give you a glimpse of one thing that would make this entirely possible. We in this room each have our own means of earning a livelihood so that we do not have to steal from each other. We do not have to lie to each other to sell our particular product. We do not have to take advantage of ignorance of each other. In other words, each of us has our own economic setup, our own family life, our own community life, so that on the whole we can say, I do not have need of anything that you possess. And you can say, I do not have anything that you possess. I do not have need of anything that you possess. And then we could look around at each other and say, I have no need of anything that you possess. I have my own source of supply, companionship, home, etc. Now, let us go one step further into the mystical and let us return to the Master, Christ Jesus, and uh, try to understand him when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread, the meat, the wine, and the water. And finally, I have meat the world knows not of. Now let us try to put ourselves in that position. For remember, he was a way shower. He was the one who was to show us the way to live in the kingdom of God. He was the one to show us the way to live spiritually. Let us for a moment realize this. I, within my own being, have the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is within me. The kingdom of God is not outside or upstairs, but the kingdom of God is within me. And I'm hearing God say, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. All that I have. I have meat the world knows not of. I am the meat and the wine and the bread. I am the resurrection. I am life eternal. Now all of this is within me. All of this is embodied in my consciousness. All of this constitutes the withinness of my own being, so that now I can accept this. I do not need to take thought for a man whose breath is in his nostril, for I myself embody the kingdom of God and all that is therein. I do not have to have the favor of princes because I myself embody bread, meat, wine, and water unto eternity. I have a presence within me that says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. 
I will be with thee to the end of the world, and I am thy bread and thy meat and thy water. Now just think that within my own being, here where I am, since the place whereon I stand is holy ground, here where I am God is, and all that God is, and all that God has is mine, and it is already established within me, and I need not look outside my own being for anything. Now, do you not see what relationship that places us in to each other? Do you not see now that it is literally true that I do not need anything that you have that you do not need anything that I have because within our own being is established this infinite storehouse, this infinity of good, this allness of God, and as we continue to look within, it pours itself forth as we need it abundantly and with twelve baskets full left over to share with others. The entire secret then of an infinite abundance, a complete and fulfilled life, the entire secret lies in realizing that there is a mystical, a transcendental presence within us that is already our infinite supply unto eternity that contains within itself our infinite companionship unto eternity, that has within itself the power of fulfillment, of expression, of multiplying itself, and leaving twelve baskets full over. Think of what happens in our own lives. The very moment our eyesight is removed from you, as a possible source of something. And the realization dawns that all that I can ever hope for, all that I can ever need in infinite abundance and until eternity is now within me and I need only open out a way for this imprisoned splendor to escape. Think now what this does to our lives the moment we know that we are not living on our brain power, we are not living on our muscle power, we are not living on our inheritance, we are not living by virtue of our business or employment, we are living because there is a mystical presence called I within me. An I that will never leave me nor forsake me, and an I that is my substance forever, and that always I can look to this I within me to fulfill itself and to multiply. Now, even though you will never see, hear, taste, touch, or smell this invisible withinness, you will always be able to witness its fruitage. For instance, if you have a fruit or a berry or a cherry tree or a rose bush, you have never seen its life. And therefore, as far as your intellect is concerned, you have no way of proving that it has a life. For you have never seen life. Life is invisible. But you have seen the fruitage of its life, because the very moment spring comes, those buds begin to appear, which bear witness to the fact that an inner invisible life is flowing, manifesting, producing, multiplying. And then eventually those buds become blossoms 
and leaves and eventually the fruit and the berries and the roses and as you see your tree in full bloom you find very li little difficulty in saying it is alive you find very little difficulty in believing that that tree has a beautiful life and an abundant life and a life that functions even while the tree appears to be dead or barren in other words while you never see life you do see the fruitage of life and though you will never see the Christ of your own being nor will you ever with your eyes see the Christ of another's being you will witness that there is this presence by its fruits you will find in the experience of those who live in the constant recognition of withinness you will find an inner peace you will find an inner integrity you will find an inner joy you will find the necessary measure of prosperity in their lives and eventually you will find health protection security all of these in evidence even though looking on from the outside you do not see what makes this take place and that is why so often students are asked what is it you have I don't know what you have but I certainly like what it does to you and of course the answer is I have a conscious awareness of that which is within me and which is within you but probably of which you do not yet have a conscious awareness a conscious knowledge I can commune with the father within me I can be in absolute communion in peace in happiness in joy with this presence that is within me and so can you after first of all you have felt the rightness of what I'm saying after you have felt that there must be some such thing and then begin the practice that ultimately leads to this awakening because now and in the West just as in India or Japan our students come to a place of transition an actual moment in their lives when they are no longer living alone when they are no longer living by the sweat of their brow or by worry or by fear or anxiety or doubt there comes an actual moment when they feel this invisible presence stirring when it either speaks to them in the still small voice or in some other way gives them the assurance I am here and I will never leave thee and I am thy bread I am thy meat I am thy success I am the health of thy countenance I am thy fortress I am thy high tower I am thy abiding place live and move and have your being in me live and move and have your being in the realization that I am here closer to you than breathing nearer than hands and feet and I go before you to make the crooked places straight I go before you to prepare mansions for you I go before you to multiply the loaves and fishes I go before you to be the cement of love between you and all whom you meet in your business life your professional life your family life and any other form of life that you are living on earth I am he that goes before you I am he that is forever with you I am he that is your rest your abiding place now you can say in quietness and in confidence 
will be my rest. In quietness and con be still. Be still and know that I, in the midst of you, am God. Be still and know that I am God, I, in the midst of you, this invisible presence, this intangible presence to human sense, but tangible in expression, practical in life. When this moment comes, and I would not give you the impression that until that moment comes that there are not many periods of doubt, frustration, sometimes even false hope, because sometimes it comes to life and then seems to lose or be lost. The earliest stages of our search for this realization uh, is a serious matter. It requires study, it requires meditation, it requires patience. But it comes, and after it comes, there is another period when there are many joys and there are many successes and then occasionally in between there are doubts and frustrations for we have not captured the fullness of the realization and so it is that we have the benefit of teachers or we have the benefit of studies we have the benefit of companionship with each other until such time as that fullness dawns. And then in the dawning of that fullness, a whole new life opens, a life of dedication and uh, a life really of, well, let's call it new joys and new successes because usually this presence, when it's realized, opens up a new pathway in life for us. I have witnessed some students who have never sung in their lives become professional singers. I have seen students become songwriters. I have witnessed others who have gone on and done things that never in their experience had they dreamed of doing. In other words, hidden capacities came to light. Hidden talents came to light. Talents that were hidden under their education or lack of it. And uh, all of a sudden now, in this light, in this illumination, whole new capacities came forth and opened up new vistas of experience. The main point that everyone should note is this, that we are not living our full lives as human beings until this experience of illumination takes place. To begin with, we're not even living God-protected lives because until that moment dawns, we are the creature spoken of by Paul who is not under the law of God, neither indeed can be. In other words, we are living a life separate and apart from God, separate and apart from God realization. Not that God is absent from within us, but because God is not consciously known, it, it is just as if God were not even there. It takes this awakening or illumination, it takes this experience of Darshan, of Satori, to awaken us to the invisible presence and power that now will live our lives and that now will instruct us and teach us, that now will guide us and direct us support us, maintain us, and sustain us. It is all done from within and yet appears without. And also, it is done without taking conscious thought. 
one does not direct this presence and say to it do this or do that one does not beg or plead with this presence for this or that one relaxes into that presence and lets it make the decisions in what direction we are to go in what capacity we are to function how we are to do and when and where and why it is really a yielding of oneself as the master did when he said nevertheless not my will but thine be done now ordinarily as human beings you must remember that when we pray ordinarily we know what it is uh, that we want and uh, unless the prayer is answered with what we want we believe the prayer is unanswered we only consider it answered prayer when it fulfills our sense of right of what we would like to have at that particular moment whereas in this spiritual life the opposite is true the only barrier to successful living is desire the moment we go to God with the idea of having God fulfill our desires be assured there is no way for the prayer to be answered no prayer can be answered that has in it a desire for something or someone or some condition at least it cannot be answered by God for that would be making God our servant and sending God out to do our bidding or to fulfill our desires as if our intelligence were greater than God's God you don't know my need but I do and so here I am to tell you hardly a way to approach omniscience the all-wise that which created the earth and all that is therein no if we remember the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and the earth created all that is therein we can then trust that intelligence to fulfill us at our level of demonstration at any given moment prayer when it is a complete relaxing in the attitude of thy will be done and not mine I do not know how to go out or how to come in I do not know how to pray or what to pray for but let thy spirit bear intercession with my spirit and I will be satisfied with fulfillment ah yes here you see is prayer that is answered and not only that is answered but we have prepared ourselves to receive the answer when we go to God with an idea of what we want and uh, we are looking in that direction for it if God sent us ten times as much we wouldn't know it because we wouldn't be looking for it where it is we would be so busy looking for just what we desired and so it is that prayer which is the life of the mystic prayer is a complete relaxing in the spirit in the awareness in the confidence that there is an all-knowing mind or God that knoweth your need before you do and that the nature of this God is divine love for it is his good pleasure to give you the kingdom not have you earn it or deserve it but give you the kingdom ah yes honor the Lord thy God love the Lord thy God with all thy heart with all thy soul and no better way to show that love than to go into this inner presence in the full realization of the infinite wisdom and the divine love which is God and then relax oneself into that care and say lead me
and I will follow. Guide me, and I will go. At this stage of our life, we come into what might be called a life of prayer, a praying without ceasing. When from early morning rising to retiring at night and sometimes in the middle of the night, we are living constantly and consciously in the realization, Thou within me art mighty, Thou within me art the presence and the power in which I rest. Thou art my bread and my meat. Thou art the inspiration of my life and the fulfillment. And there is a constant communion going on with this inner grace. The first thing you know, you find yourself bearing witness to experiences in your life that you did not consciously set in motion and which you recognize to be an act of grace. An act of God brought into your life without human volition or human will. And when this begins, you have further and further faith, deeper confidence and assurance that you can relax the hold on your own life. You can relax that fear about tomorrow or next month or next year. You can relax that all in the assurance, what more can I have than this divine presence of God itself within me, the source of all, the creator of all, the maintainer and sustainer of all, and all of this is walking around within me. You can see then that this alone would not only enable all of us in this room to re so completely relax ourselves that no one else in the room would have to fear us, but we could now walk out into the street and really look every man, woman, and child in the face and say, you will never have to fear me. I have recourse to a divine source that ye know not of. I have meat the world knows not of. Keep what you have, enjoy what you have. I have no designs on it. But you see, the miracle is this, that you would never be called upon to say it, or even to think it, because no one can ever come into your conscious presence without feeling it. They can actually feel that they do not have to have a mental wall of protection up against you. They do not have to keep their hands on their pocketbook because, quoting Emerson, what you are shrieks so loudly, I cannot hear what you say. In other words, now that you have recourse to this infinite source within yourself, your whole face shines with the assurance of your own abundance and of your own willingness to share, and there disappears from your face the lines of anxiety or concern, and your eyes become pure. No longer does desire look out from your eyes. No longer does fear look out. No longer is there any sign that anyone is in danger from you. In other words, your whole bearing shows forth the fact that you have found Aladdin's lamp. And of course, the whole story of Aladdin's lamp, which is supposed to be a fairy tale, is really the truest story in all of the world. Like most of the fairy tales, it was built on truth, but it was meant to conceal the truth from those too gross to perceive it. But the story of Aladdin's lamp is the story of I, the I that is within my own being, the I which is God, or the presence of God, the Christ, 
the Son of God. This presence, which is a power of resurrection unto my body or my business or my dollars or my home or my family, whatever temple in my life has been destroyed, I will raise it up again. This I that is within my own being, that is the Aladdin's lamp. And uh, we don't even have to rub it. We don't even have to tell it our desires. It knows before we could possibly utter, it knows our need and it is its good pleasure to fulfill it. Our only part is in remembering I have a hidden Aladdin's lamp. I have uh, the power of alchemy. This too, you know, is one of the great stories of old, this story of alchemy, turning dross into gold. Why, there's nothing mythical about that, and there's really nothing mysterious about it. Every one of us has a master alchemist within our own being, and his name is I. Why, this I will take the dross of human nature and refine it. This I that is within me will take the lack of education and uh, provide the education necessary in its place. This I within me will take the grossest, most material human nature and evolve it into the Christ. It will take the lowly fisherman, or worse yet, the tax collector, and make of him a disciple, a spiritual disciple. Ah yes, we have a master alchemist within us and Aladdin's lamp and we have the fountain of youth, poor Ponte de Leon, going off to find it in time and space. And all of the time he was carrying it in his breast. There is no greater fountain of youth than I am. I am the fountain of youth. I am the fountain of life eternal. The Master told that to the woman at the well of Samaria. Oh, if you just knew who I am, you would ask me. I could give you water that would bubble up into life eternal. And I can. This I that is in the midst of me if only you knew who I am, if you only knew what I am, if you only knew the I that is at the center of your being, you would know that you have the wellspring of life eternal, the fountain of youth within your own being. There are people who go off searching for gold mines. Gold mines. There never was a gold mine equal to the one that is within you because the gold mine that is within you has an infinity of supply not only throughout all of your days but even at the end there'll be 12 baskets full left over to leave at the probate court you see the mystical life has to do with the secret of our true identity. Who do men say that I am? Oh, some say you're a resurrected Hebrew prophet. Who do ye say that I am? And if you have risen to the spiritual level of a disciple, you will be able to say, Joel, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Because from where I sit, I can look at you and see the I, the Son of God, within you. And I know who thou art. I know thee who thou art. The beloved of the Father. And the Father is in you, and you are in the Father, for you are one, even as I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. 
and you are in me and I am in you and we are in the Father and then the circle is completed when first I realize that because of this I that I am because this I that is within me is God because I am one with this God and there is only one God and one I I am one with every spiritual identity in the world of the past the present or the future I am one with all spiritual identity whether on the level of the saints the humans the animal the vegetable or the mineral I am one with infinity by reason of my oneness with the I that I am because remember the I that I am is the I that you are for there is only one I the Father in heaven and he is your father and my father he is the I of my being and the I of your being therefore when I am one with my father I am one with you with your spiritual identity with your love with your life with your truth but not only you who are human but those of the animal world the bird world the vegetable and the mineral world they all know me and I know them because of my oneness with the eye that I am and so you will find that the moment you begin to tabernacle with the eye at the center of your being the moment that you begin to tabernacle to commune with the father within you you will find that you are talking joyously to me and to your neighbor on the left and your neighbor on the right and the first thing of all the, the final thing of all you will find that those who have been your enemies now are your friends but not temporary ones between wars but permanent ones with permanent understanding I have had this joy in my own life of having made the acquaintance of a German boy in 1907 a boy who was in New York for the purpose of learning the language and then returning home for business reasons and I had the experience of 49 years of continued friendship palship with that man through two world wars as well with never a sign of turning in our affection for each other our trust for each other and our immediate rejoining with each other after both of those wars it was possible for only one reason there never had been selfishness in our friendship and there always had been self reliance and self-reliance means reliance on the one self God which is the eye of my being and the eye of yours so that we never need each other but we have an infinite good to share with each other just think just think how wonderfully we are made think that we are a little lower than the angels I wonder sometimes if we aren't a little higher than the angels for we're, we are really God himself individually expressed and manifest as his son and we are this and because we are sons of God we are heirs of God joint heirs to all the heavenly riches and see what that does to us within ourselves when anxiety fear doubt drop away and we know that from now on and forever we can open out a way for the imprisoned splendor to escape 
we can open out a way for the infinity of good to flow out and bless all mankind. Never again need we look to get something, achieve something, attain something, but rather let it flow out from us. And above all, let us, as of this moment, stop committing the unpardonable sin. Let us stop asking God for something that God has so abundantly given to us. Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. And let us learn to live in the acknowledgement of it and in the inner gratitude for it. And then watch the miracle that takes place in our lives. Well, you know, just to look out into this room and see the many of you here coming to hear this message is a proof of the infinite nature of God and that God has given me abundantly of you. Thank you.